All right, Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 12. We're just going to look at 12, 13, 14, and 15 for tonight. And this is a very interesting part of Galatians. Because up till now, you know, the last couple of weeks has been kind of heady, kind of doctrinal. And all of a sudden, Paul throws a switch and he gets very personal here. It's very affectionate. And watch what he says here, starting at verse 12. He says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And this is one of those things, this is one of the great puzzles of the New Testament of the Bible, because no, he doesn't explain what this illness was. Um, we assume by the next uh, verse here that it was some, some trouble, some illness with his eyes, but he doesn't really tell us what this illness is, but during the time that he was here ministering in these churches in this region of Galatia, uh, he was going through some sickness, and he said, in that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Now, you see here in your notes, there's two takeaways I want to have for tonight, two things I want us to think about. Number one, <clears throat> Paul is here, he's ministering to these churches, he's going through some illness that he doesn't expound upon. Number one, God's leadership is forged in the vulnerability and the transparency of the leader. And you'll see this in any spiritual leader. If you notice God's leaders throughout the Bible, God does not hide their failures and their weaknesses, does he? In fact, sometimes it's a little embarrassing and painful for us all these years later to uh, realize what some of God's leaders experienced and how they failed. But God exposes it. It was exposed to the people in their day and time. But he does so for a reason, because true leadership comes from God's strength. It doesn't come from the leader's personal strength. And so many times the leader, you know, uh, Faults, failures, cracks, it's all exposed as a way of ministering to the people that he's leading. I put there just as a comment, never trust a leadership with a Messiah complex who projects an image of either perfection or power. And I put there in quotations that they, you know, they have that mentality of you need me to save you. And... Uh, Again, some of the classic examples, and I've mentioned this before, you take Adolf Hitler, and he had that Messiah complex of you need me to save you and to make everything right, and it's, it's amazing how spellbound millions of Germans were in that day. And you know why I think that is? I, I think a lot of it is because as men and women, we know we need help. We, we know we're not right. And instead of turning to Jesus, we turn to a man too many times. You know, it's just like Israel rejecting God as their king, and they wanted a man as a king. And there's something inside of us that we want that knight in shining armor to come and save us. And it's too hard to believe in an invisible God, so we want a visible one. And, you know, we see it now... And I, I want to be careful with what I say because I don't want to overstep my boundaries. But, you know, we see it right now with this, uh, with all of the hype that's going on with this uh, Republican candidate. And people want that power, someone who can save them. And, uh, but it's really, I say don't trust it, and you'll see why I say that in a moment, why it can be a great danger. Number one, the vulnerability and the transparency of a leader. You know, there's, there's a point where you share too much, and you don't want to step over that boundary and share 
or expose you know, what we call TMI, too much information. Um, but yet at the same time, there's got to be that vulnerability and transparency to create a connection. Look at what Paul said there. He said, verse 12, become as I am, for I also have become as what? As you are. And Paul was very careful. You know, he didn't try to hide whatever condition he had with his eyes or with this bodily illness. Uh, he was making it very clear to them, I am just like you. I am a man just like you. And what it does is that it creates in the people, those following, it creates in them a, an, an attitude and a perception that I can understand him or her and they can understand me. And there's an immediate connection because you share in the commonness of your frailties, the frailties that we all face. And whenever you have a leader who's standing up there and trying to project perfection, Deep down inside, we know, don't you know that that's not true? Uh, yeah, I think we all know. That's why I put here, vulnerability and transparency creates a trust. You know, you can trust someone who's honest, but you can't trust someone who's hiding behind a projected facade because you know that facade is not real and someday it's going to come crashing down. I put there in your notes, only the gullible believe that an individual is above human frailty. An image that is too good to be true creates suspicion. And so it's much better to be genuine and open and honest. And it goes on, and I put their vulnerability and transparency creates hope because you're looking at this leader, and he's, he's transparent, he's open about the problems and the frailties that he faces, and it creates a hope because you think, you know what, he hasn't given up. And if he's overcoming these problems in his life, then there's hope for me. I can do the same. And so Paul's statement there of, you know, I have become just like you is a, is a great measure in leadership. Is there that relationship? Is there that vulnerability, that transparency? And then I think this last one is probably the most important one. Vulnerability and transparency creates what? Focus. You're no longer trusting in that leader, you're trusting in God. And you're trusting in what God is doing in and through that leader. And so you follow the leader, but you're really not following the leader, you're following Jesus through the leader. And there's that real focus of my faith is not in a man, my faith is in God. And when the man starts to project himself as being more than he is, that steals our focus away from Jesus. And that can never take place. And so the leader has to be very careful here. And um, I like here, look how the Galatians respond to Paul's weakness. Because a lot of times we think, well, we need the knight in shining armor. We need strength. We need power. We need... And you can see it in this presidential campaign. It's like a drug. People really rally around this show of power and strength. And just remember, however it works in the world, in the kingdom of God, it's just the opposite. And I want you to think about this as we look through these verses. Uh, look at how they responded in verse 14. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as what? An angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Paul's weaknesses and frailties endeared these Christians to him even more because he was honest. He was vulnerable. He was transparent. He didn't try to cover it up or, or create a, picture, a perfect picture. And they could relate to it. And they could understand it. And it gave them hope that in the midst of his sickness, if this man came and ministered to us and preached to us, even though he was sick, that gives me hope. I can, I can do the same. Sickness doesn't have to cripple me for life. It gives me, I can trust a man like this. He's not trying to hide behind some projected image. I can relate to a man like this. I, you know, My focus, you know, as, he, as he's ministering to a sick my focus is not diverted to a man. I, I really am trusting in Jesus because I, 
I see the power of God at work in human frailty. And that just endears me to God all the more. And so you see here, when they were presented with a weak, frail, sick Paul, it didn't discourage their admiration of him at all, did it? It said, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Remember Acts chapter 7, verse 22? This is a, you know, they're recounting here the life of Moses. And this was when Moses was still in Egypt and still in a position of great power. It says Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds when he was still in Egypt. And notice God could not use him in this state. When was the power of God evident? When was the power of God magnified and exhibited? Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Now remember when this is. There, Acts 7.22 is when Moses is in Egypt. Here in Exodus 3.11, he's been out of Egypt for 40 years now. 40, 40 years in the wilderness alone, all by himself, uh, you know, and the natural, all thoughts of ever saving Israel are gone out of his mind. Any, any visions of grandeur or greatness in himself are gone. And so God appears to him in the burning bush, and he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And Moses' first reaction is, who am I? All of that self-confidence is gone. All of that feeling of, of Israel, I'm going to save you and you need me to deliver you and all that's gone. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? This conversation with God continues on. Exodus chapter 4 verse 1. Moses says, but what if they don't believe me? None of this, I'm going to convince them and they're going to follow me and I'm going to be a great leader and I'm going to deliver them. And Here's Moses really wrestling with, they're not going to listen to me, God. Further on down in the conversation, verse 10, then Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent. Seems like a contradiction of Acts 7.22, but 40 years can erase a lot of memories, can it? After 40 years, I don't remember what I was doing 40 years ago. And look at Moses' reaction here. Then Moses said to the Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Just, you know, one encouragement I want to give you tonight is if you're feeling, feeling defeated, inadequate, like you have too many problems and too many flaws for God to use you, I want you to know you are absolutely wrong. God brings us to this place of being broken, of being flawed, of having a lot of problems. And we see in God's servants that that's when God could use them the most. Chapter 4, verse 13, Moses said again, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. <laughs> what he's saying is, don't send me, Lord. No, this is a mistake. Please pick someone else, anybody else but me. They got to where in this conversation, verse 14, the anger, uh, anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Uh, Moses was, uh, the Lord was saying, come on, Moses, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to speak through you. I'm going to be your strength and your power. Now let's get with it and stop arguing with me. But it's kind of neat here to see this man that was a man of power in words and in deeds. It's, it's great to see after 40 years when he was complete, when, when self was gone and there was no more hope in his own strength or ability, that's when God could use him the greatest. So if you're surrounded by frailties and weaknesses and problems, and you are ripe. You are the right person for God to use. If you have no confidence in yourself, if you think you can do nothing right, you are the right man for God to use. Because you're going to trust in Him instead of trusting in yourself. Very important. Again, this passage from Matthew 16, verse 21. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And see, as human beings, that's the, that's the natural reaction. We want someone who will call down the 12 legions of angels. We want someone who can shut the mouth of those Jews. We want someone who can call down fire and rebuke the Roman government. We want a man of power and strength. Have you ever thought about the fact that you are following a Savior of natural weakness and defeat? Now think about that for a while. And this was Peter's reaction. This shall never happen to you. But do you realize that for Jesus to suffer and endure what he did and go to the cross, that's the, he displayed much greater strength than any human ever did or ever could. And through his apparent weakness, God was able to come forth in the resurrection and produce far greater power than if Jesus had ever become king. And so Jesus turns and said to Peter, get, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's interest. You're, you're seeing things the way man does. Man wants power and strength. Man wants this display of authority. And that's not who I am. Through my weakness, through my suffering, through my dying on the cross, God is going to be magnified and made big. And that's how God works in your life and in my life. Very important. And then number two, I wanted you to see suffering compassionately together is what produces a die-hard commitment. It's not the good times, it's not the fun times, it's not the legislative times or the religious times. It's when you hold someone and weep with them and pray with them. And it's those times when you're up at two in the morning with them, exhausted yourself. It's those times when you walk them through the most difficult part of their life. Galatians chapter 4 of this Verse 15, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. You see the strength of this relationship? You see the commitment that's, that was there? And it was there because of the pressure and the stress of Paul's illness and the other things that they were going through as a church. And that's when you really get close to someone. You know, you hear it time and time again on the news that when you go through a tragedy or you talk to soldiers that have come back that have fought together, how there is that, that inseparable, invisible bond that's between those men because they, they've been through hell together and their lives depended on one another. And that's, that's a lot tighter commitment and relationship than going to a bunch of picnics together. It's those times of adversity that bring us together. Here in Proverbs 17, verse 17, a friend loves at all times through the good, through the bad, through the pretty, through the ugly. When you succeed, when you fail, when you do what's right, when you sin, a friend loves when? At all times. The love of a friend never stops if you're a true friend. And a brother is born for adversity. You know, and sometimes people kind of chuckle at this and joke, well, yeah, I'm always fighting with my brother. I know what that's like. But that's not what this is saying. In fact, um, every commentary, if you look it up, what this is saying is that a brother will be there for you in adversity. And that's someone, your brother has seen your good and your bad and your pretty and your ugly, and that doesn't matter to him. He loves you anyway he loves you at all times and albert barnes who's a he's a commentator that uh, lived back in the uh, 19th century i did i use him quite a bit as a reference he says that the truth of this really should be at all times a friend loveth but in adversity he becomes a brother he's saying that's what that 
born is really talking about. Isn't that a neat interpretation? You know, your friend is a friend and he can be a great friend, but he becomes your brother in adversity as two lives are really melted together in the suffering and when you're compassionate and those times when you couldn't have made it without that brother. Times when his heart was touched for you and he held you as you were weeping and sobbing and he stopped being a friend. He became your brother at that point. And so that's what, you know, that's what we see here happening with, uh, with Paul. He was in a time of affliction. He was in a time of weakness, of great need. And to this church, the, he said, you would have plucked out your very eyes for me. Such commitment, such love, such compassion. Proverbs 18.24, a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And we always interpret that as Jesus, and that's great, nothing wrong with that interpretation, but it does go broader than that. It talks about through life, through the fires of life, through the storms of life, you're going to develop godly, trusted friendships for that person sticks close to you like a brother, like your own soul. It said, you know, that Jonathan and David loved each other as their own soul. Someone who sticks with you through the good times and the bad times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, we see this is the love that Paul had for really all of these churches. He said in verse 7, but we prove to be gentle among you. That's how leaders are supposed to be, gentle as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, there's to be a tenderly care from the leader to the people. And see, again, that's where this transparency and this vulnerability comes. The, the, uh, the leader is tender with you because he feels your pain because he's going through the same pain. And he doesn't see himself as being better than you he sees himself as being one of you. He knows what you're suffering, and his heart goes out to you. That's what produces the gentleness. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. This wasn't just a ministry or an endeavor or a project. You weren't just our outreach program. We loved you. We would have given you our own souls. You weren't someone just to fill the pew and preach to and hopefully drop a few dollars in the bucket. We loved you. You were a part of us. And so see the affection, see the deep love that Paul had for these people because you had become very dear to us. I like the way the New American Standard says that because you had become, meaning. This didn't happen overnight. There was a passage of time. And that passage of time was through, if you remember, they had Paul and his team had just come from Philippi at this time. And he, you know, he talks about the time, how they were just really mistreated and persecuted. And uh, so in a time of great stress and pressure and suffering and persecution, this relationship was forged with this church. And that's where relationships are built. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, he had the same passion for the Christians at Corinth. I will most gladly spend and be spent, as the King James says. Be expended, be emptied, be exhausted for your souls. And those times come through these relationships forged in suffering. So two things to take away from these verses. Just very practical, very important. True leadership comes through vulnerability and transparency. And really don't trust a situation where the leader is too good to be true or bigger than life or directing all the attention to himself or has that Messiah complex because it's going to come crashing down at some point. You want a leader who's transparent and vulnerable enough for you to see Jesus and trust Jesus instead of taking the attention for himself. And then secondly, 
remember as we come together as a community, it's really those times where we suffer together and our heart breaks for one another. Those are the times that bring us close. So Father, we thank you. We lift up this fellowship, this community. And we pray, Father, that we would always be genuine and authentic with one another. We pray for any facades or any images that we try to project. We pray that they would come down. We pray that our hearts would be open and honest with each other. And Father, we pray that we will rejoice with each other in the good times, but most of all, we pray that we will always stick closer than a brother in the bad times. And Father, thank you for those pressures and trials that come that will give us a die-hard commitment to one another, to stand by one another, to love at all times through the successes, through the failures. Father, give us a love that refuses to give up. Give us a love that refuses to stop loving because it's a love that comes from you. As we go now, Father, we ask that you would bless us. We ask that your protection, that your hand would be upon us, that you would bring us back Sunday to worship you again. Keep us safe. Keep our families safe. Keep all of the sickness out of our homes. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.